It was three weeks ago. I was doing nothing at work. Slow day, boring co-workers. I was almost praying something would happen just so I could break free from that dull atmosphere. And well, something did happen. My cell rang. I went outside the office and took the second worst call of my life. Mr. Jennings, someone asked. That's it. Who am I speaking with? I said. My name is Johnson. I'm sorry. Your daughter had an accident. Most of the stuff that happened immediately after that call is a blur. I think it was explained to me several times after I came to. One time by that doctor. Sure. I think my wife had to do it too. And my brother. And I'm sure one of her friends also spoke to me. My daughter and two other girls were walking the four blocks home from school. An idiot with too much money and too little responsibility. Out of his mind on cocaine. Somehow managed to drive his $200,000 car on the sidewalk. She died on impact. She didn't suffer. The other two girls walked away unscathed. Poor girls. I hope the survivor's guilt stops chasing them at some point. I was numb. I spent the funeral and all the days that followed numb. I'm numb even now. My wife, not so much. She went to the police station with a baseball bat. Three injured cops later, someone managed to calm her down. She swore she would kill that bastard. And I'm sure she would, if she could. But rich people can put distance between you and them without too much trouble. We are awaiting the trial. I don't think that will give us peace. Just the opposite. I barely remember certain things. I know I had a shower, wore a suit, spoke with the priest, chose the clothes she would wear in that wooden box. Her favorite blue sweater. Her favorite black pants. There were other things, things she liked more, but she was 11 and entered adolescence a little too early. You get it. She also had this stuffed toy since she was three. She still slept with him. So the little guy went with her. Jonas. That was his third name. First he was Mr. Sprinkles. Then Horace. I stood there. People came to talk to me. I don't know what they said. I don't know if I was listening at all, but it isn't hard to imagine what they said. Paid their respects. Told me how awesome my daughter was. Maybe shared an anecdote or something. After her body was below ground, I could only think about the darkness. She hated the dark so much it is not as if she was afraid of it to be honest she was never afraid of the darkness not even as a toddler she just she just hated it I bump into everything someone can bump into daddy she told me a thousand times so I always let her have the lights on no matter what we went back home and decided not to touch anything else in her room. I was thinking about closing the door and leaving it be, but I couldn't. I will go in once a week, my wife said. I will clean, and that's all. I'm not moving a single thing. I think it was then when I realized that she was not coming back. It may have been my first clear thought after that call. My wife needed more time to process it. And so we spent the next couple of days just there, looking for stuff to do to keep ourselves busy. We barely spoke. I collapsed, exhausted, 
on the fifth day. Or was it the fourth? I don't know. Once I woke up, I started to drink. One for the pain, you know. But it didn't kick in quick enough, so I downed another nine drinks. It kind of worked for a week or so, then I stopped altogether. I can't remember why. It may have been the fact that I already drank everything I had to drink, and I was too tired to go out and buy more. Or maybe some of the things my grandfather told me 20 years ago pulled me out. It doesn't matter anyway. I just sobered up. My wife was busy with an online game. I let her be. Then I returned to my job and tried to pretend nothing had changed. But tonight, I got a call around 10 p.m. My phone rang and I got the worst call of my life. Daddy. It was my daughter's voice. I am cold. Help me. She sounded afraid. I couldn't speak. She sounded afraid. I couldn't speak. As I grieve, episode two, I stood there, motionless. I don't think I was even breathing. I heard silence as the call ended suddenly. I dropped my phone and fell to my knees. And finally, I cried. I cried with such bitterness, I swear I was feeling, again, all the pain I had ever felt in my life. All the people that rejected me, rejected me a second time. All the people I lost in life, lost again, dying again, departing again without a last goodbye. All the failures, failing again. My daughter, dying again. My wife found me some time later. I was curled in a ball on the kitchen floor. She didn't say a thing. She sat next to me and cried with me. I just managed to tell her what had happened an hour or so later. I didn't want to tell her, but I had to. She didn't say a word. I saw her getting up and leaving the kitchen. I heard the doors, first our room, then the main door. I didn't see her again until the next evening. I didn't ask anything. I didn't want to know what happened after all. The next day, we avoided the issue. It was an attempt to just ignore the problem, pretending it never happened because maybe my wife thought that indeed it never happened. And it was just a grief taking over me, and I wasn't one to tell her otherwise. What would have been the point? She wouldn't have believed me. But later, it wasn't an option anymore. My phone beeped about 10 p.m. It was a notification. An unknown number sent me an image file. I opened it. It was a picture of our daughter with a cake. Surrounded by people she knew. Some other friends. Her uncle, my wife. There was a candle on the cake. The number 12. What? My wife said. You're pale. Show me what you're reading. She took the phone, and then... She was pale, too. She left the room, the house, and didn't appear again until the next day. 
I cursed myself for not buying more alcohol, but other than that, I stood there. Thinking about my little girl and that twelfth birthday she would never have. A couple of days later, my wife wanted to see the picture again. I let her. She downloaded it on her laptop and called in some help from the internet. According to people who know more than we do, it was an edited image. A very good job, but there were hints of edit if you knew what to look for. Yeah, tell me something I don't know, Einstein. Meanwhile, I took out our family pictures. There was one picture taken on her ninth birthday with a pretty similar composition. Same place in our house, some friends, my wife and her brother in it. The cake was the same one. I concluded someone took that picture, put her current friends in it, put her in it and changed the candle. It made sense. I told my wife. And who could have access to that? She asked me. Family friends, I said. You're forgetting someone. You're forgetting someone, she said. She was wrong. I wasn't forgetting him. I was avoiding his name. Doesn't matter, I said. He was here what? One time? Six years ago? He can break and enter. Do you remember? My wife said. And he can do it without leaving a trace. He could do that ten years ago. He probably still can. I nodded. Then you know what you have to do. I went to our bedroom and loaded my gun. I left my house knowing I may not come back. I won't say I didn't deserve some kind of punishment, but I didn't deserve that. That call saying, Daddy, with her voice, after my daughter's passing, that edited picture of a 12th birthday she will never have. That's too much. I don't know. Yes, he helped us. When we were in a bad place, he opened his house to us, his fridge, his bank account, and I fucked it up. In his house, when we had a roof over our heads because he allowed it. Otherwise, we would have been homeless. I opened my fucking mouth and said those things. And I threatened him when he talked back. And yes, we went the fuck away when I decided to leave, and we lived like it was our home, and yes, for fuck's sake, yes, I thought I just had it my way. And if he didn't like it, it was his own fault. And when he protested, both of us, my wife and me, lied through our teeth and made everyone side with us. We were the victims of a liar, as far as anyone was concerned. That probably cost him something. I did all of that. And she was my accomplice. And yes, we do deserve something for that. That's what you want to hear. I just said it. So I went to his house once more with my gun. I knocked on the door. We hadn't spoken in a long time, but he didn't look surprised when he opened my door. His door, I mean. What do you want? He said. I'm going to kill you. I pulled out my gun. I pointed it at his head, raising my arm slowly. Put that down, you moron, he said. We both know you're only brave if you show up with a gun and ten assholes to back you up. To be honest, he didn't even flinch. I'm going to kill you for what you did, I said. I'm going to kill you for mocking us and our pain. I've been mocking you for quite some time. So that's normal. But what is so special about this time? You know. I readied my finger on the trigger. Then I just went on a rant about what happened. You're an idiot, he said. I've been wanting to smash your windows for a long time, but I never do. And you know why? Because I'm a better human being than you and that evil fat cow you call a wife. I didn't do any of those things. You are not worth my time. 
I was about to kill him. Right then and there. And the fact that he showed no fear was only making it easier. Someone who knew how to break into our house had to have done it. Where else would anyone have gotten their hands on the pictures? I don't know. The internet? He answered. He stared at me with that know-it-all grin on his face. You idiot. You didn't even check that out, did you? He was right. Follow me, he said as he walked inside. I saw him enter his studio, taking a seat and open the browser on his laptop. He googled my daughter's name. There was a profile on a social media network, the one I knew about, with quizzes and games and stuff like that. And then there was another on the same network, and I didn't know it existed. Look at the pictures. He showed me the thumbnails. I asked him to open one. It was the same one that my wife said was edited to send to my phone. What about the call? I asked. One search later, we, he found an amateur podcast with scary stories. The sound was subpar, but my daughter said, Daddy, I'm cold, in a scared voice, the same thing I heard on the call that night. You surely feel like a damn genius, I said. I wanted to thank him, but that's the only thing I could say. Yes, he said, but I always feel like this. Perks of being a genius. Are you going to kill me now? I... I couldn't finish the sentence. I just put my gun away thinking that would be enough for him to know I wasn't going to hurt him. He smiled, nodded, and then punched me in the face. He broke my nose. I tried to pull the gun out, but he kept punching and kicking me while I was down. I'll add this to the list of reasons why you should suffer, he said as he dragged me outside. And one day, I'll have my reckoning, but not tonight. And not until you have sorted all this out. He left me on the street, bleeding, with several broken ribs, and without my gun. I went to the hospital after I was beaten by the guy I had wanted to kill. Funny thing, I changed my mind and decided he wasn't to blame for the misery my wife and me were in. Recently, after our 11-year-old daughter died in an accident. In the ER, I said I had been mugged. The fact that I had my wallet and my phone probably did raise some eyebrows. But they fixed me up and sent me home. I had a hard time speaking about all this with my wife, but I did. What are we missing? She said. The next day, we cooked dinner together. We hadn't done that in a while. Our new norm, we did as little talking as possible. We ate while watching our daughter's favorite show. I didn't understand anything that was going on in the episode. Maybe I wasn't focusing. I don't know. After we washed the dishes, after we couldn't find any more excuses not to, we entered our daughter's room. My wife turned on the computer and we went to check her browser history, but there was nothing. We spoke about it. I think she wiped it every day, my wife said. Didn't you keep an eye on what she was doing online? I asked. Mostly, she said. We agreed to have some IT friend of ours investigate the hard drive in order to find, well, anything. The next day, the guy came over with a laptop and some other tools. He did everything in front of us. We discovered several things. First, she had, at some point, a YouTube channel. We found it and watched the five videos on there. The last video was a vlog that suddenly ended. None of the videos reached 10 views. We wondered who may have watched it. Friends? Random strangers? Bots? The first videos were just everyday life vlogs. She was nine at the time. She showed her favorite toys, talked about her school, her mother, me, and little else. There was a gap after that, 
About a year later, she uploaded three more videos, 10 years old now, and a whole different person. Defiant, kind of a rebel, cursing, barely, but cursing. She spoke about her teachers, a bitch she had to deal with in school, and how she beat that bitch over and over every day. She talked about a nerd, how disgusting she was, and how she had some fun with her. I won't repeat what she said she did, and she told the story about Maid. That was the nickname she gave to some other girl. She described what she saw one time she went to her house. She never said why she went to her house. We don't know who the girl may be, but she told her friend in class, and then... It seemed like it snowballed. In a few days, everyone was calling her maid and mocking, well, her family income, I guess. I don't know how much of this is true. I hope nothing is. Otherwise, well, it doesn't matter anymore. The fifth and final video was uploaded a month ago. Again, a long gap between uploads. She was wearing makeup. She did a good job, according to my wife. And the clothes. We didn't know she had those kinds of clothes. The white top she was wearing stuck with me, since it was way too big for her and looked kind of funny. We didn't find the clothes inside her closet. She danced for the camera as she spoke to someone, her words woven with so much sexual innuendo. Whoever she was speaking to didn't talk at all. I turned the screen off. I asked how it was even possible for that to be on YouTube. Our friends said it may have been because the videos were too obscure for anyone to notice. I couldn't take it anymore. I left the room and waited outside. An hour later, my wife walked our friend to his car and then came and told me what I was afraid she was going to say. There is a lot more. So much more. And you don't want to know about it. As always, I took her advice. I've always regretted the few times I ignored her. It is better this way. And that night, again around 10 p.m., my phone rang again. Dad, if you're listening, then I'm gone. And you have to know the truth. After the first call, when I snapped out of a trance in the weeks following my daughter's death, I downloaded an app on my phone to record calls, just in case. This is what she said. Dad, if you're listening, then I'm gone, and you have to know the truth. I... I don't know where to begin. I think it all started back when I was maybe six or seven. One day, mom told me to play this, this game. It was a game, just a game. And of course, I said yes. She would take me to the park and I would play for a while and then this guy would come. She said it was another one of my uncles. I remember I asked her why I hadn't met him before and if he was another of her brothers. She said I'd never met him because he travels a lot and that he wasn't a brother, just a very close friend like Uncle Jack. The three of us would go into the trees and this uncle would tell me to turn around and I would do it. He would open my backpack and put something in it. Then the game would start. We would go in mom's car and visit lots of places in the city. Ugly, bad spots, you know. You know. Then mom would drop me off and tell me to walk one, two, three blocks until I met my new uncle. And I did it every single time. Then he would take me to another place, into the woods or an alley or something and told me to turn around. He would take something out of my backpack and order me to go back with my mom. 
Then she would give me candy and stuff. Once I was a little older, clothes, or just money. This all started after we moved out of Uncle Jack's house. I wanted to tell you once or twice, but she told me not to. It was a secret, a mother-daughter thing. And you shouldn't know, and my friends shouldn't know, and my teachers shouldn't know. If I said a word, no more candy, and no more love, she threatened me with that, that she'd stop loving me. And more than anything, I should never say a word about any of this to Uncle Jack. She was really clear about that. I don't think she would have done what she said she was going to do, but I don't want to tell you what Mommy said. Anyway, I always did as I was told. I never misbehaved. You just have to believe me. But I'm not behaving now, I guess. But you have to know because I don't know what's going to happen. And I don't want you to be mad at me or think I just left you. I didn't. If I'm gone, it wasn't because I left. He took me. This new uncle, I mean. He, one day, a week ago maybe, I had to walk a little more than normal, five blocks. I stumbled on the street. I broke the little box that was inside my backpack. I didn't notice it when it happened, but he did when he saw it. He punched me. That mark I had on my belly, it wasn't a weird fall in the bathroom. Sorry for lying to you, it was him. He hit me. He yelled at me, he took my backpack. Mom didn't lose it like she told you she did. He opened it and there was white dust all over the inside. Then he became mad. He pushed me against the wall and told me he was going to kill me for being useless. I, I didn't want to play that stupid game anymore, but Mom insisted I should anyway and he said it wasn't a game. It was a job, a job we needed. So I went with her. And every time, this uncle would remind me not to make any mistakes. Otherwise, he would kill me. I guess I made another mistake. That's why I'm recording this. There's more. There are other things I have kept safe. I don't know if you can use any of it, but everything is in Uncle Jack's house. He doesn't know it is there, but I hid some stuff in his basement, inside his pink sack. As for this recording, I will leave it with someone I trust. They'll call you a month after I'm gone. I love you, Dad. After hearing my daughter's last message, I felt that numbness again. I wish I could say I went inside and confronted my wife, but I didn't. I just took a shower, got a change of clothes, said goodbye to her on my way out, and drove my car around town for an hour or so. Once I managed to pull myself together, just enough to be able to think straight for five minutes, I set a course to a well-known house. Maybe I didn't have any right to do it. It was late. Whatever. I went to see Jack. A few days ago, I pointed a gun to his head, and he beat my ass. I ended up in the emergency room. And I was sure, even after that, he still hated me as much as he ever did. Half an hour later, I was knocking at his door. He opened, half naked, smiling. Inside, soft music was playing. A girl was laughing. He put on a serious face as soon as he saw me. What do you want now? He said. Are you gonna pull a gun on me again? Do you want a rematch? No. I was as polite as could be. I... I need a favor. He laughed, and I felt humiliated. And for a moment, I wished I had brought my gun with me. I have several. Well, that's a good one. But I'm not in the mood to laugh at you right now, Jack said. This is important, I said. 
I let him listen to the recording of the call. He wanted to hear it twice, and I allowed him. I would have said yes to almost anything he wanted. I don't have anything to do with this, he said. I know, I said. I believe her. I know she did it without you knowing, but I need that stuff she hid. Give me a second, Jack said. He went inside. The music stopped. I could hear him talking with a woman. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but she didn't sound too happy about it. She walked towards the entrance and smiled at me. Good night, mister, she said, as she fastened the belt on her black miniskirt. The white top she was using was as familiar as her face. I was sure I saw her before, and she acted accordingly. She knew me. Then Jack came back to the entrance and invited me inside. We went to the basement. At first glance, there was no pink bag. We had to search for it. It took about 15 minutes, but I found it, hidden behind some boxes full of whatever Jack had inside. Knowing him, something boring. I opened it as he watched. There were just mementos, precious to her, and from then on, precious to me. Everything seemed so random, just things an 11-year-old girl would like. A book, her favorite when she was younger. Inside, a flower withered among the pages. A picture we took a few years ago in the Grand Canyon. Things like that, and a notebook. I read it. I'll admit I was expecting some painful poetry about a boy or something. It wasn't. It was a list, places, dates, and a description and a drawing of this new uncle. The drawing. She was never meant to be an artist. But the description fit someone I knew. Someone my wife knew. Tall guy, white, with a funny mustache. Dirty blonde hair, almost always wears a green olive jacket. Scar on the left cheek. I even had a name in mind, and my face showed that I did. So, Jack asked, who is that? That know-it-all smirk was on his face again. I wanted to punch him. I wanted to punch him so hard, I would have broken him in half if I could have. You tell me, genius, I said. I don't know, Jack said. That's why I'm asking. I put everything back in the bag. Can I take this? He nodded. Aren't you going to tell me who you think that guy is? He asked. What for? This is none of your business, Jack. You know, there's a reason why your daughter decided to hide all this stuff in my place. She knew you were not supposed to be here, and by hiding it in my basement, she pulled me in. Yes, it is my business. I walked to the door as he followed me, still using those big words he liked so much. Quintessential. Antonomasia. Apocatastasis. I have two brothers-in-law, I said, once I was outside Jack's house. One is the one you know, the other was disowned by all the family. He is an addict and a drug dealer, and a danger to anyone around him. And he fits this description to a T. Joe. That is his name. My wife's other brother, the one everyone pretended didn't exist. He went to jail three times, several felonies. Nothing too violent was ever proven, but always suspected by law. The family knew better. He even broke my wife's arm when she caught him stealing money from her. He was bad news, and he had always been like that. Ever since they were kids, he was a bully and a pain in the ass. I met him briefly. 
I was present for that last argument when he was disowned. Before that, they had several interventions. Four attempts in rehab centers. Shrinks. Everything. But he was a lost cause. Maybe from the beginning. It is worth noting that, during that last fight they had, my wife was the more aggressive member of the family. She recalled every single thing he did to her, no matter how small the offense, no matter how long ago. She yelled at him for everything. Jack told me once, when we were on good terms, that words are like razor-sharp knives. I think he's right. I went back home with the bag the next day. My wife was asleep, but not for long. With as much patience as I had left on me, I woke her up. I kind of pressured her to go to the kitchen. We sat in front of each other and I showed her the evidence, the recording of that call, the things I found in Jack's basement. She opened her mouth, but I stopped her. Baby, I love you, I said. But do not even think about lying to me. Just tell me the truth for once. She couldn't look at me, but she spoke. It, it was necessary, she said, after I negotiated with Jack. Negotiated, I said. What in the hell did you negotiate? Your life, she said. He was going to kill you that night. When you threatened him, I calmed him down. I begged him to let us stay. Bullshit, I said. He was too scared to do anything about it. We stayed until I said so. No, she said. We left when I knew that guilt tripping him with how much he would hurt a little girl by killing her father wouldn't work. I, I made you believe it was your idea. But it wasn't. I just manipulated you. Then I couldn't look at her anymore. Jack is dangerous, and he hates you, and me, for sticking with you. I am sorry, but after we left his house, I wasn't making that much every month. All those races I told you about, I lied. We didn't even have the money we needed. I was one step away from a meltdown, and one day, I just bumped into Joe in the grocery store. Okay, I know he may have been following me, but that's not the point. The point is, he needed... He needed someone to pass a package with cocaine through an area that the cops frequented. I struck a deal with him. I would transport the package and make sure he got to his selling spot in exchange for a cut. The cut is what paid for food, you know. We sat there, in silence, for a long while. I don't know how long, an eternity maybe, as everything seemed to feel like since my daughter died. And so, I asked. And so, here we are. And she isn't, I said. That's not fair. What happened to her had nothing to do with all of this. I looked at her. It took me a few seconds to decide what to do. Give me your phone. I ordered. She obeyed. She had his number. I left the house and went to the police station. I had an interview with the cops and explained everything without even mentioning my daughter. They listened and made me wait. An hour later, they told me Joe was already in jail. It seems he was caught with a cocaine package. Everything I said is now evidence against him. Like it even made a difference. Once I went to my car, I got a text. It was just an address with a message. It's time to meet face to face. The three of us. Resigned, tired, exhausted. I drove to the place. At that point, it just wanted it all to end.
As I Grieve, Episode 8 I was heading to a park. When I was pulling in, I recognized the car behind me. It was Jack's. I parked. He parked. I left the car. He left the car. What are you doing here, Jack? I asked. You sent me this? He showed me his phone. There was a text. It had the address and a simple message. Let's discuss what happened after the girl died. No, I didn't. And then I explained everything that happened after I left his house, and he nodded several times. I think we're about to find out who was doing this, he said. I didn't say anything else. We walked together and sat down on a bench in front of a seesaw. A couple of minutes later, a young woman walked toward us. She was smiling. What are you doing here? I asked. She is my girlfriend, Jack said. I stared at him, and he was surprised as I was. I'm a teacher. You would have known if you ever pay a little attention in parent-teacher meetings, she said. Your daughter trusted me. Who do you think opened Jack's door so she could hide her stuff? She was watching him as she spoke. Anyway, I thought you should know the truth. Did you have to be so damn cruel? That was all I could say. No, she said. I just wanted to be cruel. And your wife? I couldn't stand to look at her. I was a good father. I never hurt her, I said. You neglected her, and your wife used her to transport drugs. You are a bad man. I could hear her glaring at me. I agree with that, Jack said. But this was a little too much. Even for these jerks. And they are liars, Jack. Her words pierced me like arrows. You're dating a psychopath, I said. And you married one, Jack answered. I loved your daughter, the woman said. That's one of the reasons I did this. Go back home and get out of Jack's life. Nobody wants you here. But you're so oblivious, you probably don't know that anyway. I couldn't say a word. I just went back to my car as they argued at the top of their lungs. And drove blindly. I just thought. I obsessed over that last video my daughter uploaded to YouTube. Full of sexual innuendos. And that woman's words. Did she... Was it just an innocent student-teacher bond? Or was it something deeper? Something sinister? And could I even trust my own thoughts? She was cruel, yes. But maybe I wanted her to be something worse. Some kind of monster. So I could feel justified in going back home, taking one of my guns, and to go looking for her. Because, I confess, I really wanted to kill that woman. But something took me out of my thoughts. A bump. A loud sound. I hit something. I was so lost inside myself I wasn't watching the road. I stepped out of my car thinking I may have killed a dog or something. And then I saw her. It. A little girl. Ten. Eleven. One bone on her knee was exposed. She was trembling. Blood flowed from her eyes and her mouth and her ears. She was contorted, broken, dead. I took her hand as people surrounded me, screaming, yelling, swearing. I closed my eyes and waited for the first punch to hit me. Sadly, I am still waiting for it. For another story, tune in next Tuesday. Meanwhile, watch another video.
And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Check the description for our social media. And sleep well. If you can. Ha 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 